Good morning, everyone. Um, we are here today for the session of the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919 and its impact on Canada with Harriet Zaidman as our presenter this morning. Harriet was a teacher librarian for 25 years. She's written three young children's picture books and a middle years novel called City on Strike. She also, if you're interested, has a, a food blog called North End Nosh. So today she'll be taking us through um, her resource and um, talking to us about the topic. So welcome everyone. Thank you, Shannon. And thank you everybody uh, for tuning in. Uh, so my novel is called City on Strike. Uh, it's set in the 1919 general strike. Uh, in Winnip uh, it was a, a huge event. It rocked uh, Canada and it rocked North America. Um, it has significance in that it um, it was a sort of a where all events came uh, to a head at a point. Uh, it was the end of the fir First World War when people had uh, uh, gone off and given their life for Queen and King and Country and come back to a um, uh, a situation where uh, there was low, um, there were no jobs, there was, um, the country had filled up with immigrants, many of whom had gone off to fight for king and country, but uh, the country had filled up with immigrants. During the war, there had been plenty of employment because, of course, people had needed uh, to work to feed the army, but uh, the people had worked for extremely low wages. Uh, the immigrants were, who were from the uh, eastern part of Europe, they were Ukrainian, Jewish, German, Polish, Russian, uh, the various Hungarian different parts of Europe like that, um, came out of desperation from the city, the places they lived in, and um, they were treated quite badly. Uh, in Winnipeg, this, is, this situation was mirrored all over North America, as you know, because of the great migrations that were taking place. But... Um, when uh, the war began, the government froze uh, wages. However, they did not freeze prices. And in, uh, uh, over the course of the uh, war, inflation went to about 65 to 80%, depending on where the people were living. And um, uh, working conditions were terrible. Hours were terrible. Um, there were great social problems. About 150,000 people went on strike in 1918 across Canada in about 500 different strikes. So this was mirrored everywhere. There was great social unrest. People wanted a better uh, justice. They wanted decent wages. But of course, uh, then you had people coming home looking for jobs. But of course, industry was shutting down because they didn't need as much. The uh, people who owned industries, of course, had made um, just huge profits and they wanted to continue it. So they lowered wages because there was greater competition for, uh, for the jobs causing even further social unrest. So if you, um, if you, uh, these, these are the dates I'll just show you of the general strike, May 15th to June 25th, 1919, that was the full blown strike. Um, but here's how you lived. If you lived in the North end of Winnipeg, this is how you live. This is a picture of an actual house. The uh, child um, death rate for children under one in Winnipeg was higher than anywhere else in the English speaking world, uh, Europe and the English speaking world. So it was 144,000 uh, children per 1,000 children died under the age of one in Winnipeg. Uh, in London, England, which was fairly a cesspool of poverty, it was 44. So, um, Pardon me, it was 89, 144 in Winnipeg, 89. So you can see how, uh, how bad it was. Um, great malnutrition. Here's another family. This is how people lived. Um, you know, there were no, uh, there was no plumbing. Uh, you know, uh, the, the typhus and other uh, diseases broke out because of the, uh, because of open sewage, sewage that used to run down the streets. So um, people literally did wear sackcloth clothing. Uh, so this is how people lived. Um, this is how um, people's uh, workplaces were. Men, men earned about $900 a year. They earned more. But um, it was simply not enough because the average five-person family needed $1,500 a year to live. 
here is, oops. Uh, okay, here is how the other side lived, sorry. This is the home of A.J. Andrews. Uh, A.J. Andrews was the um, uh, organizer, the leader of the Committee of 1000, which was the 10% uh, the of people who were of British origin who came to, to Winnipeg in about beginning in the 1880s and set up quite a nice society for themselves. If you see this park-like setting, he lived on Wellington Crescent, 947 Wellington Crescent in Winnipeg, which was the Tony Street. Um, they had very park-like settings. And interestingly, the city fathers, he had been the mayor in 1898, actually, they set up rules about, of course, who could vote. And you had to have um, um, a property, you had to be a property owner, it had to be more than 25 feet wide. This is, of course, much bigger. So they set it up so that in the north end, the immigrant area of the city, uh, properties were 24 feet. So even if you owned your property, you couldn't vote. <laughs> so it made a, a quite a difference. This is, but people live quite comfortably as opposed to the people in the north end. This is another home, which is now a restaurant, 529 Wellington. This was the home of uh, Ashdown was the name of the owner. He owned a large uh, hardware uh, store, livery store. At the side, it doesn't show you, it shows the uh, show in this picture, but it's there's the uh, place where you brought your, your horse and carriage uh, drove up and it was covered so that you wouldn't get wet when you walked into the house. So this is another picture of how the rich lived in Winnipeg. They did not uh, suffer uh, for food or for clothing, it looked like. Um, this is the first day of the strike. On May 1st, uh, things came to a head. The trades and labor counts, uh, trades and metal workers went on strike. They wanted a 40% increase. They earned, um, uh, they wanted up to about 80, 87 cents an hour or something like this. They needed a 40% increase. Um, in uh, those days, um, for instance, women earned um, five to seven dollars a week and board and room for a single woman costs about that much. And remember, just for example, there were many single women in these cities because people had just flooded out of uh, Europe. My grandmother was one of them, a single woman, like just desperate, trying to find a way to stay alive or in a living. And people uh, spent as much as they earned. So there was um, uh, the trades and metal workers, skilled workers went on strike on May 1st, but there was no negotiation. There had been this general strike in Winnipeg in 1918 and the city of Winnipeg gave a bit to the city workers and this infuriated the, uh, the businessman, A.J. Andrews was a lawyer uh, and he organized people not, and they said, do not give a, uh, an inch, do not negotiate, do not talk to them. And they would not, they, these guys banded together and they, they refused to uh, even, even have any uh, meetings. So after two weeks, the uh, metal workers asked for assistance. General strike was a tool. And if you go through um, history, you'll see that it was being used at that time. There had been uh, a, city, a general strike of 60,000 people in Seattle a few months before, which was crushed. Um, and um, in San Diego, uh, vicious uh, attack on uh, the workers there. And the businessmen taught each other. They actually businessmen from Montreal, from Minneapolis came up north to Winnipeg to school uh, the uh, the uh, elite here and how to um, how to break break unions and things like this. Anyway, this is May fifteenth when the workers said they were going to go on strike. And if you notice this, it says Mayor Gray appeals to the citizens of Winnipeg to avoid violence. And there was no suggestion of violence. And, I can tell you. The strike committee was made up of workers, mostly younger men, about 30-ish. Um, um, they got together to, um, to try to keep the city going and uh, they divided themselves up. And like, these are people who were suddenly thrust with uh, the responsibility for the city because the cities just said, no, we're not having anything to do with you. Anyway, there were people who did this. Uh, one person who is um, notable here, uh, there were only a few women, two women here I see on, this, on the strike committee. One of them was Helen Armstrong, who immediately got together and organized a soup kitchen. And it's increasingly noted that the strike would not have succeeded had it not been for the support of women in their own families cobbling together food because the uh, Committee of 1000 organized to starve people out. They refused to allow uh, goods to come into the city on, uh, on uh, 
you know, via transportation routes. So that there was an organized attempt to strike, uh, starve people out. Anyway, she organized these soup kitchens that had to move around because of the pressures of the, the committee exerted upon any owner, hotel owner who let them use their premises. Um, and they fed about 1500 people a day. First, they were supposed to feed, they, they were going to feed single women because women had no savings. They earned less, they earned no savings. But, um, but finally they opened it up to anyone. So the, um, the strike committee, uh, because people were very um, uh, committed to the strike and they were really upset when they saw people working, they created these signs, uh, which said, you know, that's okay, we're delivering milk and bread and necessities. Of course, the strike committee, uh, uh, the uh, committee of 1000 turned this on its head and said, this is the act of a Soviet, this is, a, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the hyperbole and uh, you just apply the uh, what the lessons that uh, people uh, learned from the strike or how people the strike was conducted to today's um, overrated over exaggerated jargon and you have the same thing. Um, this is, so they, they said that this was a, a you know an attack on uh, civil authority but um, yeah so they they gave out those and every day they would have meetings in Victoria Park uh, Victoria Park is where the Centennial Concert Hall in Winnipeg is currently down to the river and um, it's 10,000 people would gather there a day to hear the news because of course there was there was there was no radio even at that time. So um, what you'll notice is that everybody wore a hat. The other is there are women 30% of the strikers were women so maybe my grandmother was in there. Um, and. Um, People came out and what they did was they uh, tried to report on negotiations. And here is, um, sorry, I'm, my finger is a bit loose. Uh, Victor, Roger Bray talking in Victoria Park. And something you should note is that uh, he, the, the uh, main leaders of the strike committee were British. This, this rankled the uh, Committee of 1000 because they, they uh, launched this huge racist attacks against the uh, the uh, Eastern European immigrants, you know, that they were all here to overthrow uh, the uh, government and establish the Soviet, uh, et cetera, uh, because of the uh, October revolution that occurred in, in 1917. But actually the uh, strike leaders were British. And this is Roger Bray addressing everyone, but the majority of the workers didn't speak English. They were European. So what he did was he talked, he didn't even have a megaphone, but uh, people would whisper, those who spoke English or understood English would whisper to their little small group in their language. And so there were many languages, Russian, Yiddish, uh, Ukrainian, Polish, German, various different dialects that were being spoken at the same time, but apparently no one um, was unable to hear. This park was destroyed after this strike, a year or two after the city destroyed it put buildings there so that there was no evidence of where the strike existed, the meeting place and events took place. And um, even today, there are two or three plaques, you can't find them. The city does not want to acknowledge what happened there. And uh, it's just very interesting how there, how what little acknowledgement there is, it's almost hidden. So here is, this is not from the strike, but this is how there were marches up and down the streets. This is how the marches went. This says, Mir far der in Arbit, we want work in Yiddish. Uh, people would march down the middle. They had marshals down the, down the middle of the street to keep things in order and people lined up. And of course, this was uh, these were social events because it was a different time. You didn't have TV or everything. People went out to watch en masse. So because, and, and who marched? Uh, one of the groups that marched were the returning soldiers. The, um, the Committee of 1000 sent tr uh, cars to the Union Station, the VIA station in Winnipeg to pick up the returning soldiers. They would take them right to the Minto armories to try to indoctrinate them and recruit them to their, uh, to their side. But uh, most of the uh, returning soldiers were ordinary people. They were looking for jobs and they sympathized. So although there were some who did join their ranks, uh, the majority actually, uh, joined the, uh, the strike uh, side. And they were the ones who marched en masse, mostly during uh, every day, they would just march. And one day they marched onto Wellington Crescent, which just um, uh, set the uh, uh, elite, uh, you know, that they were, they had, they had guns by their doors. They set up um, 
Uh, they had a Kelvin High School, which uh, the older one had a turret at the top and they had snipers to uh, mar uh, watch in case the, uh, the North Enders marched over and they were gonna, they said they were gonna take over their houses. They were all planning on which house they were selecting, which house they were gonna take over. So none of these things occurred. So, and uh, AJ Andrews had uh, commissioned, um, become commissioned for, to uh, represent the federal government. It's a very murky uh, thing, basically, because of the lack of uh, transportation and, and uh, his ability to manipulate um, lied and basically took over the uh, uh, sort of governance of the city in a very uh, extra legal way. It's an interesting history to read. Um, anyways, because of the uh, uh, large number of marches that were taking place, 2,000 uh, soldiers at one in one march, I'm told, although when um, A.J. Andrews reported to the federal government, he reported there were only 500. So he, he was manipulating it. But the committee of 1,000 decided that they would organize marches, and so they had, they had the means, and so they had these big... Um, Thing, um, uh, demonstrations. This is their headquarters, the building that they were headquartered at. Another thing the Committee of 1000 did was they issued lapel pins with the Union Jack on it to show they were patriotic. And they talked about them being a lot loving uh, God and country. So this says, we will maintain constituted authority, law and order, down with the high cost of living to hell with the alien enemy, God save the king. And that sort of summarizes the uh, the meanness, the, the uh, cruelty that they uh, uh, viewed the, uh, the, rule, the underclass with. To hell with the alien enemy. And um, the free press uh, um, had an editorial that suggested that the immigrants should be uh, sent back to the countries from which they were vomited. And it uh, it's uh, it's just uh, was consistent. Uh, the telegram said the immigrants' ignorance is impenetrable, their customs are repulsive, their civilization is primitive, their characters and morals are justly condemned. They are surely not the class of people paid immigration agents should seek. I can tell you that my grandmother, who was had a, a grade three education, uh, read um, Dostoevsky and all sorts of other uh, books in English, even though she was not educated at all, never mind in English, she came from Russia. And uh, uh, my uh, grandfather who took part in this was a po love poetry. Uh, this is it's just this vicious uh, uh, racist attacks on people because they uh, wanted to, these people wanted to continue being um, the uh, cream of society, high, pro high profits in their businesses and in their industries. To hell with the high cost of living is interesting because the man who organized this, Ed Parnell, he organized this march. He owned the biggest bakery in Winnipeg. He, uh, before the strike, raised the price of bread by two cents so he could profit from it. <laughs> and God save the king, you know. <clears throat> the strike continued and there were no negotiations, none. And th but the city was quite peaceful, you know. It was, it was all in limbo. There were marches, but they, people went home and people were... Um, uh, actually, the uh, strike committee organized social activities to keep people busy, like bicycle rallies and things like this, teaching kids how to ride bikes and, you know, sort of try and keep people's spirits up. But of course, it was getting very difficult. Um, the police had wanted to join a union. The city didn't want them to join a union. And they insisted, uh, the, the city insisted that the police sign an oath vowing not to join a union. And they called it, uh, you know, a, a slave pact. So 90% of the police refused to join and uh, they were all fired. This had been sort of provoked. Um, the former premier of Manitoba, uh, whose name was, uh, who was John A. Macdonald's son, Hugh John Macdonald. Um, <clears throat> he was now the, uh, the sheriff of Manitoba. Uh, it was his idea to uh, for, uh, that this pact should be offered and that they should be fired if they didn't sign it. So what the police did was they replaced uh, they were replaced by specials. They were the sons of wealthy families, university students, some soldiers, and uh, employers had who had signed up to be part of the committee of one thousand had to contribute something. So some of them, so what they contributed often was their employees. Uh, it was. Um, a desperation 
but they, uh, for some people to take it, but they were paid six bucks a day, which was very, uh, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure there were even some strikers because six bucks a day, people had nothing. So this was a very attractive uh, wage. They also gave them a band on their arm that said special uh, police, and they gave them a baton. Um, so uh, that was, uh, you know, pretty important. And they gave them a horse to use uh, from Eaton's department store. They gave them use of a horse and those were used. So that was the, this is a, a significant day in the strike. Until then, nothing, nothing had been happening because there were no negotiations. <clears throat> so on June 9th, there were every day there were, um, there were um, marches. So this is Portage in Maine. And uh, there was a, a march and suddenly uh, out of nowhere uh, came a, a man, a special on a horse attacking and uh, thwacking down with his baton at people. And they, the strikers yanked him off his horse and um, beat him up and sent him packing. So this was an opportunity for the uh, Committee of 1000 to, uh, you know, to uh, propagandize. The Committee of 1000 had um, a bulletin they called the Citizen, it was distributed free. And uh, their uh, propaganda was uh, quite vicious. They said that uh, on one day, you know, they said there were seven men sent across from Europe. They were sent to Winnipeg to foment the revolution so that Canada's authority would be uh, challenged and the revolution, the Russian revolution would take place, the overthrow of the government would take place, starting in Winnipeg. Another day it was people had been uh, sent from New York. It didn't matter what, there was no end to the uh, propaganda. The, the, um, the uh, citizen was written by, um, uh, the, the editor was Travis Sweatman, whose name still appears, it was, you know, it's a prominent family and they're still a prominent family in Winnipeg, they was a prominent lawyer, his name appears still in a uh, law firm. Another one was Isaac Pitblado, whose name also uh, uh, appears. But in general, there was only 34 names of the Committee of 1000 known. There were no minutes taken of any of their, minute, of their uh, meetings. Uh, there's no archives of anything they did. They kept very secret. Uh, but they pretended that they were representing the middle class. You know, they were representing uh, the, the 150,000, 180,000 that people lived here. Uh, in total, there are about there's estimated that about 30, 35,000 people went on strike in Winnipeg. Many of them were union members, about 11,000 were union members, I think. But the rest weren't because the situation was so bad that people just walked off their job. So this is the, the, uh, the event that changed everything. Suddenly this man came out and suddenly the, uh, the Committee of 1000 had an opportunity to use it against people. Here it is. Um, uh, and if you notice here in the corner, it says Winnipeg riot in this uh, bottom corner. And that is uh, uh, the way that um, it was presented by the Committee of 1000, that it was, um, it was right. But if you'll see, there is no riot taking place. And that's what these pictures are by a, um, a photographer, L.B. Foote. And I use him in my novel. Uh, because there's not too much known about his personality. So I gave him a persona, not, I didn't influence him too much, but I, I gave him a persona. But if we hadn't had the pictures, despite what he wrote there, Winnipeg Riot, um, we wouldn't actually know what happened except for the, uh, the way the, uh, the Committee of 1000 presented it. There was no riot except on behalf of the, uh, the people who uh, the committee represented. And by the way, the labor group had, the, the, the strike committee did have a bulletin as well. It was called the Winnipeg, uh, the, uh, the labor bulletin. And it um, uh, cost five cents though, because they had no money. They had no money. The Winnipeg Free Press, the Winnipeg Telegram, the newspapers, they gave the, um, the uh, Committee of 1000 free advertising, by the way. Anyway, so here is the uh, June 10th event. And um, it was, uh, here are the, uh, uh, specials, they poured out suddenly to attack people. So that you can imagine how scary that was. The uh, strikers were not armed at all. And uh, this, this changed everything. Okay, so from then on, uh, these men went out and they, um, they uh, roamed the streets. So there was now, um, you know, uh, attacks on people who if they were gathered, you know, they were people who were being uh, 
hit with billy clubs and batons. So that was uh, changing everything. So there's great tension in the city then. And um, then this occurred. And I don't think this actually has had enough prominence. Um, between uh, June uh, 15th and 16th, there was a storm. You look at the violence of that storm. So you have people who were um, poor to begin with, no savings. Uh, their houses, they were, they were being starved out. They had no, the city was actually running out of food. The uh, soup kitchen that Helen Armstrong organized was running out of food. Farmers uh, in the near area apparently had contributed some food and people used to just bring what they could to feed everybody. But the soup kitchen was running out of food. So here you have a very desperate situation and you're ha look at what happened to people's house. But some kind of uh, tornado if may have touched down, but um, this is another picture of what uh, Winnipeg looked like, Winnipeg streets looked like, and people just had to clean it up. And uh, you'll notice how people dressed. The, the previous picture showed women in babushkas, you know, something that uh, when, I, when I go to uh, speak with children in workshops, I take the babushka that my baba, my grandmother gave me when I was a kid because she wore a babushka and she thought it was, uh, you know, she thought it was nice to wear. So I used to love to wear this babushka when I was a kid. And um, so I, I take it with me. And I, I, I um, talk to kids and I say, you know, am I, am I an okay person if I wear this? And they say, yes. Am I an okay Canadian? Well, yes. And, uh, and I wear it in all sorts of different ways. And then I put it on sort of like a hijab. And I say, am I an okay Canadian if I'm like this? And they children say, yes. The uh, lessons of the strike, this lessons of racism and uh, vicious discrimination are the same uh, today uh, as they were then. And the, the, uh, the purpose is to cause chaos within people's minds, to talk about, about anything that is unimportant except for what is really important. And in those days, it was um, the uh, supremacy of a class that was profiteering and uh, uh, keeping people, uh, denying people their rights of citizenship. And it's the same today in, uh, in the States, we see it dramatically, but it is the same uh, today here. Okay, <clears throat> so there was no movement and um, the uh, uh, committee of 1000 decided to act. Overnight, they, uh, I would just like to say that everything that the Committee of 1000 organized was illegal. Uh, it's, it's appalling if you read the, uh, the histories. Uh, the 10, 10 strike leaders were arrested in their sleeps, in, the, in their beds. They were taken to Stony Mountain Penitentiary and they were taken there instead of the Winnipeg, uh, the Vaughan Street Jail, which was the Winnipeg Remand Center then, because they didn't want people um, gathering. So um, what they did was they arrested those people uh, they uh, ransacked the strike headquarters, which was on James and Main, right near the uh, Victoria Park. Uh, they ransacked it. They destroyed it. Uh, smashed everything. Took um, were, they were searching for information, so they took uh, documents to try to find lists of people. And they also raided the Ukrainian Labor Temple on Pritchard and McGregor, and the Jewish Liberty Temple on uh, Pritchard and Salter in the North End. Those were buildings, just community buildings uh, where people gathered. They, they, the uh, Ukrainian labor temple had a printing press, they smashed it. It had just opened uh, about two, two months earlier. They smashed it and took all the documents. And uh, it's, uh, it was just this uh, uh, real effort at intimidation. And uh, people on the other side, the strikers had nothing to, to be able to fight it with. So the people who were taken to Stony Mountain, 10 of these strike leaders were taken to Stony Mountain. Helen Armstrong organized a, a truckloads of children to go out the next day. She was a very plucky woman. She was arrested four times during the strike and they kept releasing her and she just kept going back to her work. And uh, we assume her husband was arrested, George Armstrong. Um, we sort of assumed that she wasn't arrested because she was a woman. But uh, she was uh, a plucky person who then took children out the next day to harass the uh, authorities by having them sing uh, songs of resistance all day uh, at, the, at, the, uh, at the penitentiary. So um, this was huge. It you know, was intended to break the strike. Um, and uh, so and it, what happened was they, uh, the uh, people 
uh, moved in to fill the void, you know, to uh, get the strike bullet and keep uh, going and to organize. So the uh, uh, returning soldiers decided that on June 21st, they would organize a march, a silent march. And they were going to march to the uh, where the uh, Higgins in Maine, where the Royal Alexander Hotel was. The Canadian, the federal minister of labor, Gideon Robertson, had come to Winnipeg. He had been in Winnipeg before at the beginning of the strike, but did not meet with the strikers at all. Uh, but he came back and uh, returning soldiers said they were going to march silently. It was going to be a silent march and just to press the, uh, their, their uh, demands for work and for justice, you know, that these, these strike leaders should, uh, should uh, be released. They were released, but they were, had to sign an agreement not to participate in further act, strike activities. So that was pretty serious. It hampered this, the, you know, the leadership was gone. There were people who were, there were um, three people who were not uh, released. They were three immigrant uh, leaders, um, a man named Chara, Charitnov, uh, Moses Almazov, and one other. And uh, so that was the, the Eastern European leader, uh, leaders who were minor in terms of the strike committee, but they were not released. And uh, that was actually just a representative of the racism at the time. And to be quite honest, they, it took a month for those people to be released. The uh, British strike leaders, the, the seven strike leaders were released after a few days. And it actually took a lot of pressure to get the strike committee to support uh, these other people being released because of the times. You, it was the times there was the racism and suspicion within the uh, you know, uh, resentments within the strike strikers themselves. So <clears throat> anyway, on June 21st, <clears throat> this march took place. Uh, people were lined up on either side of Main Street, as you saw in that previous um, uh, slide. <clears throat> anyway, what happens was suddenly um, a streetcar started to come up and um, up Main Street and the streetcar workers had been on strike. This was a deliberate provocation driven by a strike breaker <clears throat> and people were desperate. So um, this angered people. They pushed out, went, went out in the street, and pushed that uh, uh, streetcar over. And uh, someone threw something in there, and one of, and the seats started to smolder. So one one or two seats started to smolder. But notice that there is no riot taking place. So just keep that in mind that there is no um, no violence taking place. But suddenly, out of uh, people were milling around looking at it. Out of uh, the side came um, came uh, uh, mounties on horseback, and they rode into the crowd and terrifying people. But you still see that people are just were just sort of shocked. And every account of it is that people were just like, "What's going on?" They rode into the crowd. They were rebuffed. They were pushed back, and they uh, they were some some. Um, riders were pulled off their horses. They were trying to, they were beating from above. And one of the people they were beating above was my grandfather, my, who was about 21 years old. I don't know what work he did, but um, people were being beaten. Anyway, they, they pulled a few people down. And so the, the uh, Mounties retreated and uh, they thought it was over. They thought that was it. They thought they had you know won or just pushed them back. But the uh, Mounties came back and uh, that's when they, they shot into the air, into the crowd, pardon me. And uh, one man we know uh, was killed right away. Another man died uh, later, but there were a lot of people injured. Uh, according to the uh, papers, 94 people were arrested or something like this. Um, and a few people went to hospital, but there were actually hundreds of people injured that day. Uh, they did not go to the hospital because they were, there were mass, de there were deportations taking place. They were arresting people, finding any excuse uh, to um, to uh, deport people, you know, uh, uh, Hugh John McDonald had set up uh, as sheriff had uh, organized uh, that there were internment camps set up uh, in around the Dauphin area. Some people were being shipped up there and then being deported. It was a pretty um, authoritarian, uh, autocratic time. So anyway, these the uh, the Mounties uh, shot people and that caused people to run like crazy and uh, a lot of them ran down Market Street towards the river 
and um, this is what happened. The uh, specials were waiting. The police station was quite nearby. They, the uh, the specials have been hiding in there. You see the behind, you see the uh, smoldering seats uh, in the uh, streetcar. The specials were unleashed. They came out with their batons and their uh, uh, cruelty and started to chase people. And if you notice back here, <laughs> like people were just like, what's going on? There's no, see a man is standing there with his arm on the, uh, uh, and then they started to chase people. And what they did was, um, they smashed people's heads. Uh, they hemmed people into an alley, which is, was uh, about where the Manitoba Theater Center is across the street. There was an alley between two buildings and they hemmed them in on either side. And uh, apparently a lot of people were injured there. And uh, they called it Hell's Alley after that. But um, what happened was uh, that many people, they just ran and ran away. Um, I was told later by someone that uh, a, a woman who had uh, some, uh, you know, health training, uh, she uh, opened up her house and it was sort of a, a makeshift hospital. So I think things like that took place all over the place, but there were relatively uh, few people who went to hospital because they were subject to arrest. I know that the, my grandfather went and hid in the, uh, the vegetable cellar, the cold cellars they had beside people's homes uh, because uh, they were going around arresting people and uh, deporting them. So this, uh, they, the uh, specials took over the streets and uh, what they did then was, oops, they, uh, see, this is them, they had their, they, they, you know, and you can see below the uh, people were just lined up. Like they just did not know what to do. Yet it says Winnipeg riots at the bottom of the uh, picture, AJ, uh, LB Foote wrote that. So that it's just this, um, different way of looking at the world you know this is a riot by whom um so uh what they did was they um they then brought out uh machine guns <laughs> they ordered people off the street and if you said you're not off the street we will kill you <laughs> and they were prepared to do that so it did of course uh, send people flying they, um they had they had brought those in um specially you know they shipped them in specially um on a uh, flat cars for this purpose and they had marshaled them at um, where the Great West Life building is in Winnipeg now that was where um, and on the legislative grounds they had set up these these camps for the uh, Northwest Mounted Police and the militia that they organized uh, they they blocked they tried to block the uh, exit of people to the North End because immigrants for the most part lived in the North End there were there was a British working class that lived in the North End as well as the West End. That's, uh, you know, the West part of the city. That's where a lot of them came from. But they tried to block the underpass going back to the North End with, with rows of specials. So people had to uh, desperately find their way back home. Anyway, this, is, this was the, uh, what they were threatening the working class with for the demand of higher, better wages, food for their children, <laughs> and uh, better working conditions because the working conditions were terribly unsafe. Uh, so all over Canada, this is a march uh, in support of the uh, the strike breakers. The the strike was called off. The strike committee called the strike off on June 25th. They said go back to work tomorrow, like June 26th, 11 a.m. Uh, because they did not want violence. They wanted um, they wanted decent work working conditions, good wages, and the right to organize. There was it was key because uh, employers would not let people organize. So all over Canada, there was um, um, support for the uh, people who had uh, been arrested. And um, in another illegal, extra legal move, the Committee of 1000, led by A.J. Andrews, who led the prosecutions himself, charged the strike leaders with sedition. So that is, uh, it was simply illegal. They, they bypassed, I don't know, the, I think the federal, the provincial government in this situation was sort of, had sort of been uh, excluded. It just shows you how a coup can take place in a society. This little committee of 1000 with uh, A.J. Andrews at the head took it over. He and uh, Swetman prosecuted these uh, um, uh, trials of sedition. And uh, although, um, uh, not uh, everyone was um, uh, convicted because of their own, uh, they had to conduct their own, um, 
their own defense. Uh, several of the strike leaders were sentenced from, to, from six months to two years in jail and they served at R.B. Russell. Uh, these these uh, people who were young people whose crime was uh, leading, their, uh, leading their union and doing good things for, uh, to, to do good things for society. So they served their time. They were all, many of them were elected to the legislature to city council and the legislature and parliament while they were in jail, because such was the, um, the support and the admiration. So the, this uh, march was to raise uh, awareness and to raise money for their defense. Um, people like uh, John Queen, became, uh, who was a leader, he became mayor of Winnipeg after. Um, uh, R.J. Johns uh, is someone who, uh, uh, was was blacklisted. There was huge blacklisting. A lot of people who were skilled tradesmen who had been involved in the strike had to leave the city afterwards because they couldn't get jobs. They were blacklisted. Uh, but Dick Johns, Richard Johns, uh, he was hired uh, by as a caretaker. He was a skilled uh, tradesman. He was hired as a caretaker because someone was his friend in the Winnipeg School Division. But he finally rose to the ranks so that and contributed such that uh, Tech Bach, which was a technical high school founded here after World War II, and Red River College were, uh, were uh, institutions that he helped found. These are people who wanted to do things for society. Woodsworth and uh, A.J. A. A. Heaps went on to parliament. And so the, the um, uh, programs they worked on, uh, pensions, um, child allowance, uh, social insurance, these are uh, ideas that came about because of these people pressed it they, through this, what became the Canadian Commonwealth Federation and then the NDP. These ideas, uh, yes, Shannon. Oops, can't hear you, you're muted, you're muted. I just wanted to interrupt as we're about 18 minutes to the end and yeah. just to remind people, um, we've had a few questions on the chat Oh, okay. um, and uh, to remind people that they can put questions in. I just hadn't found a seamless spot to interrupt you. But as this, okay. as this photo has been on the screen for a while and throughout this um, presentation, you have shared with us such an uh, incredible array of photographs. And one of the educators has asked, um, images are a great way to connect with students. Is there a way to access the pictures you're using or is just this something you've done throughout your own research? Uh, well, a lot of these pictures are available through the Manitoba archives. Uh, you know, there's uh, uh, LB Foot. There, his his pictures are online. There is an L, if you look up LB Foot, you can find all pretty well all his pictures online. He took pictures of everything. He was a photographer, a commercial photographer around the city for years. His pictures are very interesting in terms of recording Winnipeg as a developing city over the over thirty uh, or more years. But I can also contribute. I can also uh, pass on all these pictures. I have way more, uh, actually. <laughs> and, and the second question is a lot in line with what you're speaking about right now. So the title of this conference is Teaching History and Social Studies in the Time of COVID. How do you think this topic intersects? For example, how do you see the themes and lessons of the Winnipeg general strike as relevant to the current context? Well, because the pandemic has unleashed a pandemic of racism, a pandemic of uh, cruelty, uh, blaming, and uh, um, un unsubstantiated and unscientific ideas, disinformation. And that is exactly what was spread during that time. I can give you an, an it is just embarrassing to see to what was, uh, what was uh, printed in the, um, in the newspapers at the time, vicious racist uh, activity because of the people who were, uh, you know, the vested interests, the newspapers were vest part of the vested uh, interests as well. And, uh, you know, certain men from across the Atlantic who arrived seven, minute, seven months ago and settled in Winnipeg, um, you know, came to uh, uh, undermine the authority, uh, uh, overthrow the government. It's it, what these things that were printed in, it was all nonsense, Bolshevism and all this. Actually, uh, so all these, there were ideas circulating. You must, uh, you know, they're circulating all the time within every group. The uh, Russian Revolution had freed um, of the peasantry in Russia and uh, unleashed all sorts of other ideas. You know, of course it deprived other people of their rights. The question is, is was that just? 
But, you know, there was the one big union idea, the one big union formed after the 1919 strike. So there were lots of ideas going around, but the strike committee, actually, the only newspaper that presented this fairly was the, the Toronto Telegram. Uh, reporters came from all over North America here because it was such, you know, prolonged event. And the only person who interviewed both the strike committee and the committee of 1000 was a reporter from the Toronto Telegram. And the, the uh, strike leader said, no, we're not interested in overthrowing. This is what we're interested in, the right to organize, the right to the higher wages, better working conditions. That's it. Thank you. We'll let you continue, but just a reminder to participants that they can ask questions on the live Q&A, and then I will try to find a spot to interrupt at about five minutes to the end of the session. I'll make sure that I pause if there are any questions. Thank you, okay. Harry. All right, so that's uh, that was the... Um, um, there, this is the aftermath. The strike committee called it off to avoid further violence. Six strike leaders were convicted and received uh, sentences from six months to two years. And there they are. In you know, there these are the strike leaders who were who had been arrested. And it's just, um, but they like. Um, so here's an interesting detail. Uh, the federal government deputized A.J. Andrews, uh, Travis Swetman, and Isaac Pinto to be their representatives, uh, with Andrews in charge. Um, they didn't actually negotiate, I don't think, that we don't have any evidence of them negotiating any fee. So, um, but uh, Andrews, seeing a, a cash cow, uh, charged for all his services, including the extra legal trial that was held in the summer. And he, he uh, billed the uh, Canadian government for more than Robert Borden, the prime minister, earned that year. And his friends, uh, you know, who were assisting him, they, they submitted some bills too. Um, and uh, and they paid it. The federal government paid it from a fund that was uh, supposed to be earmarked for to support returning soldiers. So there you go. And as opposed to that, the strike leaders gave up their freedom and just worked the rest of their damn lives for for uh, social good. So who's the better person? You know, it's, I guess it's your uh, uh, decision. But I I have my my views about this. It's just really um, uh, telling. There is one picture of the Committee of 1000, or it's thought to be their victory dinner. There's, there's no um, um, information written on this. It was uh, you know, uh, on this uh, picture. But that was thought to be their victory dinner afterwards. They smashed the strike. People were arrested. People lived in great poverty. Winnipeg was a really ruined city for the next 10 years. And then the depression hit, and then people were destitute. There was no roaring 20s for the working class. And that's extended all over North America. It would have been quite a different story. Uh, so that that's um, that is what happened. And uh, this is this is my family story. That because um, you know my parents were both born in 1922. I used a lot of. There's a ton of memoirs people wrote about it. I used a lot of uh, color from my own family story in writing this book. But this is this is what people experience. And my um, the relationship to today is that. Um, when people are discriminated against on the basis of their um, race or their uh, their country of origin, and then it was white on white, but uh, it didn't matter. It was your your name mattered a bit, your name and your pedigree, and that lasted into Winnipeg. I'm telling you until the 70s. You know who are you? Where are you from? Very first job I had, I was like, what are you? What are you? It wasn't um, what part of the city are you from, or are you good at your job? It was, uh, what's your origin? What is your ethnic origin? And when uh, my family or origin happens to be Jewish, uh, the 16 year old girl who was working with me, she just burst out laughing. Oh, you, you people kind of thing. Uh, she came from a part of the city where she never met any, uh, you know, so-called aliens. And, uh, you, you know, it's just, it's just these things, you know, when you have this kind of uh, uh, idea perpetuated, as we can see that people have perpetuated these ideas with their family with the amount of racist, uh, the racist uh, uh, nonsense that's been taking place, in, you know, in uh, the States, you know, most mostly on on uh, on view there, but here too, um, that uh, it, it's just perpetuated and it has to be addressed directly and people say these ideas are wrong. Go meet people, be with people. Are you a good person? Are you a good teacher? Are you a good uh, worker? Uh, so it's it's completely relevant to today. And when people are discriminated against, they're they're um, 
their uh, opportunities in life economically, socially are limited and our society is uh, uh, hampered, is held back because of that. So that's, that's uh, the relationship to today. And um, uh, I, I set children in the novel, a, a 13 year old boy who is, um, um, delivers papers. I, I, I used both my dad, who was a, a paper boy in the 30s, and another man who delivered paper. Uh, James H. Gray was a, a, a delivery boy during the strike um, uh, to uh, model that because he could get around. And an 11 year old, his sister, who's about 11, so she has the, uh, the uh, picture of a child's, a real more innocent view of it. So uh, boys, boys and girls. So yeah, so that's uh, the story. So any other questions I'd be happy to, to talk about. Yes, so we have another question and it's perfect for what's on the screen right now. Can you tell us about ways teachers have used City on Strike in their classrooms? Oh, well, uh, from the point of view of talking about racism, uh, it's the perfect example. And what it does is it shows children, this is what our, how our country was built. Who built our country? The forces that operated. And um, that it, it, it uh, teaches children because because as I said, um, the ruling class won and the strike was never taught and only talked about in certain terms. So it shows children, this is what our history of our, our city and our country is. And it shows, uh, those are, that's very good for kids whose uh, families have been here for generations. And we have a lot of children who are coming new to the country. This is how Canada, this is what Canada was and is, this is how you know, so it's pretty, um, it shows them that the situation is today uh, similar, and it shows a more, um, a more ballot, a more <laughs> realistic history of what Canada is. It's not just um, events, and it's what happened, it's, it, and to teach them that history is not just an event. This happened on this day, this happened on this day. It's what happened to people, what happened to people. Um, it does uh, not have an Indigenous uh, angle because uh, in the sense that although there were indigenous people in the city, um, there were not there were not many First Nations people. They were really excluded from the city. You know, we had taken the land had been taken over, and people uh, there were Métis more probably, but uh, there was great um, there was great discrimination against the Métis. So uh, we don't. I actually tried, but was not able to find much history about that those groups within the strike, although. You know, and uh, other historians have told me the same thing. So that is one thing, but it does show you exactly like this is um, a more realistic uh, part of how his history took place, how, how our country was built. And it, it relates to the situation that uh, uh, people are experiencing today in terms of um, the upheavals that are taking place in society, the discussions about who belongs in society and who is valuable. Thank you for that. Um, those are the questions that are currently on the app. So just a reminder, if people want to add any more questions, now would be the time to do so. Otherwise, I will monopolize and ask my own. <laughs> um, so uh, throughout the presentation, you spoke a lot about media representations and stories that are told, language that is used, like the use of the term riot um, and <laughs> control of the media. How do you think the Winnipeg general strike and the story you tell here inform some of the media literacies that are necessary in this moment? Well, uh, it's a, it's a, teaches uh, people that they have to be critical thinkers. You have to, you have to find out the facts. So, um, so, I mean, the opposites are Fox news, you know, where they, you know, kind of thing where they use these inflamed, inflamed rhetoric uh, to, describe what's happening or they just lie so mm -hmm. so the um the importance of digging down and finding the truth is very important and uh it has a huge relationship to the pandemic because you have people uh, spreading disinformation find out what's going on and uh, just as an um just to remind you that in 1918 there had been the flu epidemic here uh mm -hmm. which was also uh you know various and if you go back through uh history, the flu epidemics have been blamed on various different groups. Uh, there's a, just a book that's come out. I just have, I happen to have it here. Uh, I'll just pull it out. 
uh, field notes from a pandemic. I just have the ARC, so it's a little rough. Um, it's about, it, it uh, just written about the, uh, the pandemic today, but he relates it back to different uh, uh, epidemics in, in history and talks about the disinformation that uh, was spread, which justified um, some pretty um, racist um, uh, attacks on different groups. And, uh, uh, it, and it also uh, deflected the ruling groups, uh, ruling classes in those, in those eras, their responsibility for society. So uh, it's the same thing, uh, you know, you have a government uh, pretending, you know, it's not, it'll all go away, it's not my fault, blah, blah, blah. And uh, so people should, uh, or, or it's this, it's that, people sh should learn from this to be critical thinkers. When they see something that is um, uh, hysterical, where, mm -hmm. where it's hyperbole, they should learn, recognize that. Who is saying this? Why are they saying it? Um, we have a comment. Uh, this is not a question, just a comment to say thank you for such an interesting presentation. I look forward to reading the book. I really appreciate the links you draw from history to today, the way that disinformation, as you just spoke about, influences events, very topical. Um, and I think the way you spoke about exclusion as well to add on to this, what this commenter has, has said. Um, you know, I will, uh, if anybody is interested, I'll do a virtual presentation with kids. I love to do it. You know, I'd love to be in schools right now. Um, yeah, I'm a teacher. So, so with that said, you have also said that people could reach out to you about the photos that you used. Is there a best way for folks to contact you? Well, I, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter, but uh, Harry H. Zaidman, H-Z-A-I-D-M-A-N at gmail.com. Just contact me any, any of those ways. Um, uh, North End Notch, there's a contact form on North End Notch. <laughs> so, yeah. Throw in a recipe and I'll try it. Uh, yeah, so I'm I'm glad to do it uh, to participate. Um, I uh, this is my 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 idea of a good time. And and your three other children's picture books, would you say they have um, similar educational themes? Oh, absolutely. Well, this one, <laughs> this one is actually based on my dad when uh, a poor boy looking for a dream. And uh, it's, so this is actually a North End story. And uh, it's about, you should have your dreams, no matter how poor you are. The dream might turn out differently, but it turns out, it turns out well. I've got another one about a sheep. Oh, pardon me. This is my dog who, uh, who, learns, uh, who learns by reading by, uh, by, with all the books she knocks off the couch. That is, oh. <laughs> so she solves all the family's problems. Very smart, much smarter than there. And uh, this is about, I went to England and there, I loved all the sheep there. So this is about a sheep who's, they have sheep shape contests there, which if you look that up on YouTube, it's hilarious. Um, and this sheep, they can't get into shape. Somehow this sheep ends up in school and uh, the, <laughs> learns math. You know, and the kids learn, the kids learn, uh, get fresh air and exercise. She learns uh, how to help them with their math and blah, blah, blah. So all educational. I'm a teacher. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. We have another thank you in the chat. Uh, yes, thank you. So um, as we understand from the organizers, the live feed will cut off at exactly 10 o'clock. So Harriet has given you a way to reach out to her um, through Gmail, has also suggested that she would come into schools, which I know all teachers would love to hear right now. Um, I guess a final question, Harriet, where do you find in the city would be some of your public displays of art that you would want to take these conversations if you were taking a field trip to talk about the general strike? Well, go down to the city hall area. The one place, the one monument that was finally put up was put up last year. And there's a hilarious story behind it. The streetcar, they put a monument of the streetcar uh, tipped over in front of uh, the Pantages Theater there on the Market and Main. And uh, so the sculptor told me, he said, he doesn't know why. The city did nothing to mark the strike. The city itself didn't. There were no events organized by the city. Every There were a couple hundred events organized by diff other different organizations, labor unions, community groups. But he said he doesn't know why, but every time he applied for a grant, they approved it. And he doesn't know why. Even under the Harper government, the federal government, they approved it. So he just kept quietly doing it. <laughs> and it is a tremendous, finally got up there. And there's some rule that it can't be moved. I don't know. So finally, the strikers have uh, a place. It is a, the great place. That is where the uh, action, the so-called action, the attack on the strikers took place. And uh, it's, um, it's a pretty important um, 
monument for the, to, to recognize and to acknowledge the, uh, the, uh, the thousands, tens of thousands of people who tried to uh, do something, who sacrificed to make lives better for our generation. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's 10 o'clock. So we assume this is going to cut off. There was one more comment, um, but I worry I will ask it and then we will run out of time. It was just in regards to the Winnipeg leaders uh, being terrified of a Soviet revolution happening here and your choice not to engage that as part of your work. They weren't. They weren't uh, like that. The, the strike committee wasn't. I mean, you can go into all sorts of history and all sorts of different people. But the strike committee wasn't, and it was just in, it was, in, you know, invented uh, and magnified on the part of the committee of 1000. So, um, you know, there all the histories. One of the best books to read is How the State Trembled. Um, so I'll just give you that. Uh, they're written by two University of Brandon history, history professors, How the State Trembled. It's just a, or When the State Trembled, pardon me. Mitchell is one of the authors. I don't see my copy here. Uh, it's um, it, how the Committee of 1000 broke the uh, Winnipeg general strike. Huge, huge, huge misinformation campaign, lies um, and exaggeration and uh, facts were different. Excellent. So yeah. online, I can see that the session is over, but oh. our feed still says um, live. So I'm just going to stop the live stream. Thank